I would venture to guess that most Broadway fans, if asked, would be able to name the longest running musical in Broadway history. Gentlemen! The Phantom of the Opera has held that record for more than a decade and a half by now, with a more than 3600 performance lead over its closest competitors, the still running Chicago and The Lion King. Broadway fans might also know the prior holder of the long run record, Cats. <laughs> And people are probably aware of shows like Wicked and Les Mis, listed at time of writing as fifth and sixth longest running, respectively, even if those shows never held the number one spot. Some of the most well-known musicals earned their status by virtue of running on Broadway forever. But Broadway hosts more than just musicals, obviously. So here's a question. Do you know the longest running play in Broadway history? You probably don't. You might have guesses. Most people I've asked figure it must be Death of a Salesman or A Streetcar Named Desire, one of those big classics. But for those of you who are at home screaming the title Life with Father, wow, this video is for you. Life with Father is a play by Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss, adapted from the writings of Clarence Day, which ran on Broadway for a then record setting, 3,224 performances, or about seven years and eight months. And if you know nothing about it, that might have something to do with the fact that it closed almost 75 years ago. What that means is, in more than seven decades of Broadway history, no play has ever broken Life with Father's record. But other plays from the 1930s and 40s are still known today, despite having shorter Broadway runs, or no Broadway run at all. So what exactly allowed this now unknown play to dominate the stage for so long? And how has it managed to retain its status as the longest running play for even longer? Well, this video is going to attempt to answer three basic questions. What the hell is life with father? How did it manage to run on Broadway for seven and a half years? And what would it take for a play to break its record on Broadway today? So before I get too far into the history of the play, a concise summary of the plot of Life with Father is going to be necessary, just for context of everything I'm about to say. Also, so you're aware, the show footage you're going to see throughout this video comes from the 1947 film adaptation of Life with Father, released by Warner Bros. While I normally wouldn't use a film adaptation as a substitute for the stage play, I'm using it here because A, it's astonishingly close to the stage version, B, there is no professionally filmed footage of the stage production, and C, the film fell into the public domain in 1975, so I can use as much footage as I want without YouTube getting mad at me. Also, obviously, spoiler warning. Life with Father is an autobiographical story about the childhood of Clarence Day Jr. in New York's Madison Avenue around the late 1880s. Clarence is the oldest of four children, alongside his younger siblings, John, Whitney, and Harlan. Come and help me, Dad! Their father is Clarence Day Sr., here referred to as father to avoid confusion, and their mother, Lavinia, often called Vinny or just mother. Act 1, Scene 1. As the play begins, two plot points are quickly set in motion. Mother has invited two women, cousin Cora and her friend Mary Skinner, to stay at the house. And Clarence Jr. is in need of a new suit, and must borrow one of his father's. Father spends the opening scene, set at breakfast, abusing and belittling the new maid, Annie, how many times have I asked you not to engage a maid who doesn't know how to serve properly? As well as complaining about the tight budget. After Father heads off to work at Wall Street, Cora and Mary arrive. Clarence Jr., who has just discussed his disinterest in girls with John, suddenly realizes an interest in Mary, which appears to be mutual. Cora didn't tell me about you. I never met a Yale man before. <laughs> Act 1, Scene 2. Whitney recites his catechism to Mother and the visiting Reverend Lloyd. When Father returns home, Reverend Lloyd asks him about donating to the church, but Father refuses. Mother, a devoutly religious woman, tries to sway him, but Father sees the matter as purely financial. Many, if there's one place the church should leave alone, it's a man's soul. Cora and Mary return from shopping downtown, and Father discovers that not only has Mother invited them to stay at the house for several days... Are uh, those two women encamped in our house? Now, Claire... Answer me, Benny. Now, Claire, you know... Answer me! Just a minute. But has also made arrangements for the four of them to dine out that evening at Delmonico's. What's that? Delmonico's? You're taking Mother, Cousin Cora, and Miss Skinner to Delmonico's for dinner tonight. Oh, God! Despite Father's bluster, Mother wins the argument. As they leave to prepare, Clarence and Mary share an awkward first flirtation. At home, our living room is green. I like green. I like green, too. 
It comes out that Mary is Methodist while the Day family are Episcopalian. So, you know, it'll never work. I just remembered something. My father was an Episcopalian. He was baptized an Episcopalian. He was an Episcopalian right up to the time he married my mother. She was the Methodist. Oh. Mary asks father about being Episcopalian, and then the big reveal. You were baptized an Episcopalian? Come to think of it, I don't believe I was ever baptized at all. Claire, that's not very funny, joking about a subject like that. I'm not joking. I remember now, I never was baptized. Claire, that's ridiculous. Everybody's baptized. What? I'm not. Thus, the play's main tension is established. Mother's insistence that father be baptized, yes, I will continue to pronounce it that way, despite father's absolute resistance to it. Don't get excited over nothing. Why haven't you ever told me? End of Act 1. Act 2, Scene 1. Returning from church, Father complains that the sermon was all about the importance of baptism, which, it turns out, was in response to Mother asking Reverend Lloyd about having Father baptized beforehand. Clarence Jr. complains to Mother that, while wearing Father's suit, he can't help but act how Father would. And not to kneel in church is a sacrilege. Making Father's trousers kneel seem more of a sacrilege. Clarence! This, naturally, puts a major roadblock in his attempts to woo Mary, as he reacts dismissively to her advances. It's because this is the last time we'll be together. Mary, please! Father decides to have a talk with Clarence Jr. about women, which... You see, Clarence, we men have to run this world, and it's not an easy job. Now, I love my wife just as much as any man, but that doesn't mean that I should stand for a lot of falderall. Well, anyway, Mother agrees with Clarence Jr. that he needs a new suit, but a conversation about the budget with Father basically turns into an Abbott and Costello routine about where the money went. I gave you six dollars to buy a new coffee pot. Here's the bill. One coffee pot, five dollars. So you owe me a dollar and you can hand it right over. I'll do nothing of the kind. What did you do with that six dollars? I spent four dollars and a half for that new umbrella. Six dollars and fifty cents, and that's another fifty cents you owe me. I don't owe you anything. Yeah, so, to summarize... Women be shopping, baby! <laughs> Women be shopping! John and Clarence Jr. hatch a plan to become door-to-door -door salesmen to raise the money to buy Clarence Jr. a new suit, and John a bicycle, and at the end of the scene, Cora and Mary leave. Clarence Jr. begins writing a letter to Mary. Act 2, Scene 2. Mary's reply letter to Clarence Jr. arrives, reciprocating his love. However, more importantly, Mother is sick and Father... I guess just doesn't believe in sickness? It's just weak to give in to an ailment. I notice when you have a headache, you yell and groan and swear enough. Well, that's to prove to the headache that I'm stronger than it is. John arrives with the merchandise to be sold door to door. You took a job for us to go out and sell medicine? What's the matter with Mother? I don't know. She was just complaining. Say, it says here it's good for women's complaints. And, believing it will help Mother, pours it in her tea. When the result makes her even sicker, Father is shocked by the arrival of two medical doctors and Reverend Lloyd, all called it to care for what he now realizes is a serious threat to Mother's safety. In desperation over possibly losing his wife, and also after getting shamed by his catechism reciting son, wherein the person is baptized in the name of... You haven't been baptized, have you, Father? Father makes a promise to the heavens that, if it will help Mother live, he will agree to be baptized. Get well, Vinny. I'll be baptized, I promise. I'll be baptized. You will? I'll do anything. After Mother hears this, Father and Mother embrace. End of Act 2. Act 3, Scene 1. Clarence Jr. brings home a ceramic pug dog sculpture that Mother bought, which Father immediately objects to. Mother also reveals to Father that she has scheduled his agreed-upon baptism at a North Harlem church the next morning. However, he immediately goes back on his promise to be baptized because he is the, the worst. worst. In arguing about the baptism in the pug dog, Father says this. I'll tell you one thing. I'll never be baptized as long as that hideous monstrosity is in this house. Mother takes that to mean that the removal of the dog is a guarantee of being baptized and sends Clarence Jr. back to return it. But not before Clarence Jr. realizes that, since the dog and the new suit both cost $15, he could exchange one for the other. Just before the scene ends, Father reveals a ring he bought for Mother at Tiffany's, and finally says the words that have up to this point only been implied. What did you say, Claire? I said we've been married for 20 years, and I've loved you every minute of it. You said you loved me. And this beautiful ring, that's something else I didn't expect. The two sit together as the lights fade. Act 3, Scene 2. Cora and Mary return to the house, and a letter arrives revealing that the medicine John was selling has killed a neighbor's dog. 
The truth about Mother's illness is quickly revealed and wrapped up, just in time for Mother to reveal to Father, because everything in this play is a last minute surprise, that there's a cab outside waiting to take him to his baptism. Father resists one final time, but after looking over his loving family, he finally relents. But then why aren't you ready? Get your hat on! Oh, tarnation! The family all leave to see Father baptized, except for Clarence and Mary. The play ends on the image of Clarence in his own suit, finally being able to kneel before Mary, as his father never could. Oh, God! End of play. So on the surface, Life with Father is not that dramatic a play. No family secrets are unearthed, no infidelity ever revealed. Even the conflict over being baptized isn't so much framed as save father's immortal soul as could you stop being a man for one second and do something for your wife? That said, structurally the play does a lot right. The motivation of each character, from scene to scene, is clearly defined, and the dialogue sets up future turns in the plot without giving away what will happen. Father's dismissal of Whitney learning his catechism establishes his resistance to donating to the church in the next scene. Because if he doesn't know his catechism, he can't be confirmed. But Vinny Whitney's going to pitch today. He can be confirmed any old time. Father reading Clarence Jr.'s mail by mistake. I think that's for me, Father. But then why isn't it addressed to Clarence Day Jr.? Oh. It is. means that there's a reason to read Mary's letter aloud, better than the actor unconvincingly reading it aloud to himself and the audience. Clarence Jr. continually encounters new obstacles towards having his own suit, but every change of tactic sets up a new plot point, from John's medicine sales to the romance with Mary. While the play may not be the most emotionally complex, Lindsay and Krauss did a good job of interweaving moments in the story, such that every action in the play feels triggered by earlier events in the plot. Except for Mother buying the pug dog, that, that comes out of nowhere. When archiving Clarence Day's writing for the New York Public Library, archivist James Mosk spoke to the investigatory nature of Day's recollections of his childhood. Day was fascinated by the changing roles of men and women in American society, as Victorian conceptions of marriage, family, and domestic order unraveled in the first decades of the 20th century. Reading the action of the play closely, this commentary is evident. While Father is positioned as the breadwinner and master of the house, most of the play's major disagreements don't end up going in his favor. Mother is exceedingly adept at pushing his buttons and finding the exact holes in his masculine armor. I don't owe you any dollar and a half. Why, Clarence Day, what kind of man are you? And what's more, all if right. you... Thank you, Claire. Now the accounts are all straight again. With that said, the play strikes this delicate balance of undercutting Father's bluster without ever actually challenging the social order that gives him authority. Mother is able to assert herself in small ways, and Clarence Jr. ends the play by doing something his father never would. But the world around them, the cause of their domestic strife, is never in danger of being overturned. An author's note in the script gives this summation. Mother is feminine, and father is masculine, and that is the entire basis of their conflict. For every moment where Father's unshakable paternalism is being played for laughs... What makes you so sure they'll let you into heaven? Well, if they don't, I'll certainly raise a devil of a row. There's a companion moment where it feels like the play is still endorsing him. A woman thinks... No, I'm wrong right there. A woman doesn't think at all. She gets stirred up. And she gets stirred up over the most confounded things. This duality plays into how the show ran for as long as it did. People saw what they wanted to see in it. With motivated cognition, Life with Father could be read as either entrenchedly conservative or slyly liberal. Perhaps the best comparison to Life with Father in this regard is actually the show that beat its long-run record on Broadway, the musical Fiddler on the Roof. Plot-wise, the two scripts are fairly similar, a conservative patriarch having to balance his love of his family with his children's increasing willingness to break traditions that he sees as fundamental. The difference, and it's a significant one, is in what our protagonist's arc is. In Life with Father, the protagonist is Clarence Jr., who slowly realizes that in order to make his own life, he will have to literally remove the clothes he is borrowing and become more than just a mirror image of his father. In Fiddler, the father is the protagonist, and Tevia has to overcome not just his daughters, but an entire world that is progressing faster than he can make allowances in tradition for it. And in the end, his love of his family forces him to grow and change. And God be with you. Father Day, in Life with Father, 
will change for a moment when responding to his family, but always returns to stasis by the start of the next scene. In Fiddler, the father figure evolves because his traditions cannot remain unaltered in a progressing world. In Life with Father, the father figure never truly changes, because the world as he sees it, and as the author sees it, isn't really going to change either. Another aspect we can't ignore is how the fictional Day family is framed within the narrative, an aspect borrowed directly from the original book. Here is a quote from E.B. White, writing about the author Clarence Day. He was born on Murray Hill and spent a conventional New York childhood in a house on Madison Avenue, between 48th and 49th Streets. A well-to-do little fellow, summering in London, graduating eventually from Yale. Compare this with a quote from Clarence Day himself, on why he was reluctant to license adaptations of his writing. Men have written books about real people before, but generally because they had some strange or phenomenal thing happen to them. But here was a family that owes its very life to the fact that nothing happened to them. Nothing, that is, except to live a warm, rich, quarrelsome, and affectionate family life, and to be uninhibitedly themselves within the handsomely paneled walls of an absolutely conventional world in New York of the 1880s. The word conventional is doing a lot of work there, but perhaps it's best rephrased in a third quote, this one directly from the novel of Life with Father, in which Clarence Jr. says, I never supposed that our daily lives were different from anyone else's until I went off on visits myself. And this insularity is almost certainly by design in the play. The presumed normality of the Day family's life in the 1880s feeds into a Depression-era audience's nostalgia for the good days, for an imagined, nostalgic past that has since been lost. It's not within the play's interest to lampshade how the Day family's upper-middle-class wasp life is not really an everyman situation. Even when Mother is potentially poisoned, the danger is resolved quickly and brings the family closer together. Real life-or-death peril does not happen to this family. If it did, they may become too unique, or to use Day's words, too phenomenal. While the play is written well, its truest impact is as a time capsule of I love the 1880s zeitgeist. It speaks to the nostalgia of an audience who have similarly never supposed their daily lives were different from anyone else's, while serving as a light comedy for those who haven't lived through its setting. So that is Broadway's longest running play a well-crafted comedy of domestic life that looks nostalgically backwards about as much as it looks to the future. So, for part two of this video, how did this run for seven and a half years? Clarence Day, the author, was educated at Yale, following a comfortable childhood on Madison Avenue. His father, Clarence Day Sr., even gave him a job at his law practice after graduating, like every wealthy finance bro working today. However, after only a few months on Wall Street, Day left to enlist in the Navy in 1898, where he quickly came down with a debilitating case of arthritis. He left the Navy after less than a year, returned to Wall Street, left his job as a stockbroker in 1903, and then spent the remainder of his life bouncing from job to job, editing the Yale Alumni Weekly, writing essays for The New Yorker, ran the book department at Metropolitan Magazine, whatever would be least taxing on his body. But it was the 1932 publication of God and My Father, a series of autobiographical sketches about Day's childhood, that would really cement his legacy as a writer. Its follow-up, Life with Father, in 1935, was an even bigger hit. Although Day would only barely be around to see it, passing away from pneumonia later that year. Thus, his final book, Life with Mother, was published posthumously, and he never lived to see any of the theatrical successes that his stories would become. As I mentioned, Day was hesitant to license his stories for adaptation, since he didn't see his family's life as particularly unique. Still, the popularity of the books did bring in quite a few offers, including a film adaptation from Paramount, which was rejected when Day learned they planned to cast comedian W.C. Fields as father. Day grew increasingly concerned in his final months about how his writing had, for better or worse, immortalized his family. To quote his widow, Catherine Day, When people began writing or talking to us not about your father or your mother, but about father and mother, Clarence turned to me and said, 
Damnation. They don't belong to me anymore. They just belong to everybody. There's a parallel to be drawn between Life with Father and the modern trend of film the stage adaptations. Day's books were hugely popular, and despite Day's resistance to believing that they would benefit from adaptation, the drive to capitalize on a popular book made an adaptation inevitable, especially following his death. The idea for a play based on Day's books came from producer Oscar Serlin, who brought the idea to writer Howard Lindsay. Lindsay, along with his writing partner Russell Krauss, were well known as show doctors for Broadway musicals, having repaired the book for Cole Porter's Anything Goes in 1934. Since then, the pair had written books for Cole Porter's Red Hot and Blue and Harburg Arlen's Hooray for What, but Life with Father would be their first non-musical written together. After getting formal approval from Catherine Day, Lindsay and Krauss spent two years whittling down Day's stories into a concise three-act play. Despite the title, the script interweaves plot threads from all three of the father-mother books. The only major plot elements created by Lindsay and Krauss is the character of Mary Skinner, invented to give Clarence Jr. a romantic arc, and John's short career as a door-to-door -door salesman and possible dog murderer. Some scenes from the book are replicated word for word in the stage adaptation. Finny, I wish to heaven you wouldn't talk about matters you don't know anything about. I do too know about them. Miss Gulick says that every intelligent woman should have some opinion Who about... Who may I ask is Miss Gulick? She's the current events woman I told you about, and the tickets are a dollar every Tuesday. Do you mean to tell me that a pack of idle-minded females pay a dollar apiece to hear another female gavel about the events of the day? But even when scenes are created anew, they contain elements from the book that audiences would recognize. While the character of Mary is invented, her Act 2 scene with Clarence Jr. contains elements of this quote from the books. It was a curious fact that everything that Father had ever owned seemed to be permanently a part of him. No matter what happened to it, it remained impressed with his personality. The night I most fully realized this, I remember, was when a girl whom Father would have by no means approved of sat on what was my lap, but his trousers. Father was a good 80 miles away and safely in bed, but I became so preoccupied and ill at ease that I got up and left. I'll show you how much I like you. Get up, get up! The original Broadway cast included Lindsay himself as father, and Lindsay's real-life wife, Dorothy Stickney, as mother. The play debuted in August 1939 at the Lakewood Players, a summer theater in Maine, before a formal out-of-town tryout for a week at the Maryland Theater in Baltimore. After performing from October 30th to November 4th, the production was packed up and shipped to the Empire Theater in New York, officially opening with no previews on November 8th, 1939. One selling point of the production was the intense level of realism that it strived for. As the real-life Day family were redheads, all of the child actors were required to dye their hair red for the show, with the adults wearing wigs, a move that would later be replicated on film, with the detail apparently so important to preserve that it became the reason the film was shot in Technicolor. The published script includes a full paragraph on the challenges of accurately replicating the red hair, ending with... It is important, however, that the family be redheaded in temperament, vital and spirited. Catherine Day also lent the production many props and set pieces from the real Day family home. The napkin rings referenced in the first scene were genuinely the ones used by the family in the 1880s. And the one with the little dog on it is Harlan's, of course. As well as the silverware, the side table, two family portraits, the irons in the fireplace, and multiple pieces of jewelry. In discussing the loan, Catherine Day replied, Goodness knows how I'll get along without furniture this winter. Or, you know, the next seven winters. At the time that Life with Father opened, Broadway's long-run record was held by the still-running play Tobacco Road, a gritty social drama about poor workers in rural Georgia. It had overcome initially mixed to negative reviews when it opened in 1933, managing to secure the long-run record by courting audiences interested in seeing such a controversial show, and also by slashing ticket prices. Life with Father, however, was a success from the moment it opened in New York, and maintained its popularity throughout the entirety of its seven-year, eight-month run. A national tour was quickly planned, starring Percy Warham and Lillian Gish, it began in February 1940, with another week-long run in Baltimore before finally settling in Chicago for a then-record 66-week run. The second replica production, with Lewis Calhoun and Dorothy Gish, Lillian's sister, 
started again in Baltimore before running for several months in Boston, and then touring to Philadelphia and Detroit. Productions after that continued to tour normally, although all subsequent touring casts still kicked off with a week-long run at the Maryland Theater in Baltimore, or the nearby Ford Theater. Not that one. By the end of the run, an unprecedented 121 child actors had played the three younger day boys, either on Broadway or on tour. Although, on Broadway, there were four actors who stayed with the production for the entire run. The press cheered for the play on March 25th, 1942, when it became the fourth play ever to reach 1,000 performances, and again on June 14th, 1947, when the play beat Tobacco Road for the longest Broadway run ever, and finally on July 12th, 1947, when Life with the Father finally closed on Broadway after 3,224 performances. Now, even after Life with Father closed, it had a long afterlife in American culture. A sequel play, titled Life with Mother and adapting many of the unused stories from Day's books, opened on Broadway in 1948, in a production that featured many of the original Life with Father cast members returning to their roles. The sequel, however, only ran about eight months before closing, or one-twelfth the length of its predecessor. There was also a film adaptation, released only a month after the Broadway production closed, starring William Powell and Irene Dunn. Aside from some readjustment of dialogue within each scene, the film is a fairly close adaptation of the play, even adding some elements from the books that the play left out, such as Mother's purchase of a rubber plant and Clarence Jr.'s middling skill at the violin. Incidentally, Mary is played on film by 15-year-old Elizabeth Taylor. There was also a television adaptation, running on CBS from 1953 to 55, starring Leon Ames and Lorreen Tuttle. While the stories on the show weren't adapted directly from those in the books, the episodic nature of Day's novel, plus the inability of Father to retain a life lesson for longer than 15 minutes, made the format oddly fitting. Although it was filmed in black and white, so you do lose the important red hair. But even if Life with Father had faded out of the popular zeitgeist by the 1960s, its impact during its Broadway run cannot be ignored as its seven-year run on Broadway contained almost the entirety of World War II, the play served its own small part in the war effort on the home front. Service members who took shore leave in New York would often attend Life with Father, the play serving the dual purpose of providing a nostalgic view of American life, as well as the play's long run serving as its own symbol of American endurance. To quote theater scholar Jordan Schildkraut, the theater has become home, the actress is mother, and the role is the civilian life that awaits at the end of the war. The very length of the run allows life with father to become an object of nostalgic yearning, something to which we can return home. Quick fun fact, all of the breakfast scenes in the play were staged using practical food props, which led to an absolutely incredible article in the Boston Globe in 1940 referring to the play as one of the eatingest plays in the annals of the American stage. That included a grocery bill, by that point, of 65 pounds of coffee, 520 pounds of butter, 1,560 slices of toast, 3,120 tea biscuits, and over 3,600 oranges. In fact, halfway through the run, the producers were forced to find alternatives for butter and sugar, since those products were being rationed in New York. Which brings us back to the war effort. The Broadway cast traveled to Washington, D.C. in 1940 to put on a special benefit performance for Eleanor Roosevelt and FDR, as well as benefit performances for the troops in 1943 and 45. Eighteen of the young boys who performed in the show, on Broadway or on tour, would later go on to serve in World War II, a fact used in advertisements for the play. Journalists saw the conflict in the play, of an absolute leader being cleverly undercut by those he would aim to gain control over, as an apt metaphor for the war itself, which, given my earlier analysis of the play, might be a bit of a mixed metaphor. But regardless, Life with Father's success can be attributed, to a not insignificant degree, to the fact that it opened two months after the invasion of Poland and closed a year after the Nuremberg Trials. In his 1939 review of Life with Father, critic Brooks Atkinson quipped that 
Sooner or later, everyone will have to see life with father, for the late Clarence Day's vastly amusing sketches of his despotic parent have now been translated into a perfect comedy, and must be reckoned an authentic port of our American culture. And for a play running at a time before televisions were common in America, its reach to audiences was incredibly impressive. I mentioned tours before, but I didn't mention quite how widespread they were. By the time the Broadway production closed, there had been nine touring companies in North America, with replica productions running in London's West End, in Sydney, Australia, and a French-language production about to open in Paris. While the Broadway production played to 2.81 million audience members, the tours collectively performed to 3.65 million. The gross for producer Oscar Serlin eclipsed $10 million. That's $123 million today, adjusted for inflation. An absolutely unheard of profit for Broadway at the time. All of this together forms an answer to how Life with Father sustains such a long run on Broadway. Unknown literary source material, positive reviews from audiences and critics, a secure place in the cultural conversation, audience nostalgia for both the play's setting and the play itself, an aggressive touring schedule, and the luck to open just as Americans most wanted a light-hearted, entertaining story about a conventional family. That said, it's now been nearly 75 years since Life with Father closed on Broadway. So here we enter Act 3 of the video. How has no other play beaten its run? A quick note on measurement before we begin. You can measure the run of a Broadway show in two different ways, in years and in performance count. On average, you can expect a Broadway show to run a little over 400 performances in a year, and to hit 1,000 performances in around two and a half years, again, on average. I'm going to refer to the following shows mainly by their performance count, although I'll throw in a year measurement where it feels relevant. There have been 26 Broadway plays, ever, to run longer than 1,000 performances. 17 of the plays on this list opened after Life with Father closed in 1947, but of those 17, only 6 ran the additional 250 performances needed to make it to the three-year milestone. The longest running of these, Gemini from 1977, ran 1,819 performances, or a few months over half Life with Father's run. The most recent play on this list is Brighton Beach Memoirs, which closed in 1986 after 1,299 performances. What that means, of course, is that no play has reached even one-third of Life with Father's run in almost 40 years. There are a few reasons for this. As production expenses have risen on Broadway, producers have been less willing to believe that plays will recoup, unless they have a solid chance of winning a major industry award that would bolster their run. It's significant that, of the 11 plays to open since 2000 to run longer than a year on Broadway, all but four of them won the Tony Award for Best Play, and of the four, only two weren't nominated. Of course, the reliance on awards as marketing is itself a consequence of another huge cultural shift, which just so happened to occur right before Brighton Beach Memoirs. The refocusing of Broadway around New York tourism led to a refocusing by producers on projects that would be accessible to a tourist audience. Paired with the British invasion of the 1980s and an increased reliance on spectacle in production, it became less and less likely that tourist audiences would choose to see a Broadway play over a Broadway musical, making it harder for plays to sustain a long run in the way Life with Father did. But more than that, many of the most successful Broadway plays of the last two decades have been produced by off-Broadway companies, either in productions that begin off-Broadway and then transfer, or those that are produced in Broadway houses but on limited runs. Roundabout Theatre Company owns the Broadway house Studio 54, Second Stage owns the Helen Hayes, and Lincoln Center owns the Vivian Beaumont. While some of the plays produced in these houses may have open runs, the subscriber model of the producing organization makes it more likely that the play will be produced on a limited run, or that the open run may end sooner than it would if it had been staged directly by Broadway producers. Of course, even if no play has reached a thousand performances since 1986, there have been Broadway plays that have managed to sustain an open run. The Wikipedia article for longest-running Broadway productions of all kinds uses 1,000 performances as its lower cutoff, so no play since Brighton Beach Memoirs appears on that list. So, 
I've taken it upon myself to create my own list, documenting every Broadway play that ran longer than a year since 1980. That list can be found in the description of this video, and it is illuminating to see how trends have changed. The longest-running Broadway play to open since Brighton Beach Memoirs is Proof by David Auburn, a Tony and Pulitzer winner that closed after 917 performances on Broadway. Just short. But Proof is actually emblematic of a trend that has already come to an end, namely the trend of small cast dramas being the long runners on Broadway. Six plays that opened between 2000 and 2010 ran longer than a year, with cast sizes of 3, 4, 4, 4, 5, and 13, the outlier being August Osage County, although it's still a naturalistic drama. This is interesting to compare to the five plays that opened between 2010 to 2020 that ran longer than a year, which have cast sizes of 8, 15, 24, 35, and 40. Now, obviously, cast size is not always the perfect measurement to use in comparing the content of a play, but it is the most quantifiable way of saying that these plays are big. While there are still smaller, unit-set plays that find success on Broadway, the long runners of the last decade have looked more like musicals in their scale and technical elements. They are spectacles in the same sense that the British invasion musicals of the 1980s were spectacles. A comparison that's incredibly appropriate in this context, as four of the five are West End transfers. And now that I've brought up the subject of expensive British imports, it is time now to talk about the play that, in my opinion, has the greatest chance of finally breaking the thousand performance barrier, and in time, may even dethrone life with father. As much as I don't like talking about her, we have to talk about Joanne and her boy wizard. I just realized I didn't have my ring light on for the entire, like, first part of this video, but... I'm gonna look different, but I'd rather be lit than consistent. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child is not the longest-running play of the 2010s. That honor is currently held by The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime at 799 performances. However, Potter is currently sitting at 785 performances and will be reopening on November 12th, so it will almost certainly run the 15 additional performances it will take to take that title away from Curious Incident. Now, two quick caveats to that. First, Playbill has informed me via email that its 785 performances counts Part 1 and Part 2 of Cursed Child as separate performances, which is some bullshit. but... Fine, I guess the 1981 production of Nicholas Nickleby sets a precedent. But secondarily, the producers announced last summer that when Cursed Child returns to Broadway, it will be edited down to a one-part, single-evening play. And if they try to claim that a play that has been literally cut to half its runtime is the same play, I'm going to be extremely upset. Now, this video is actually in the unique position of being filmed before the show returns to Broadway, but being released after, so... Editor Zach, which is future Zach to me, is going to put the current performance count on screen. My guess is that I'm going to be upset. But regardless of how Cursed Child counts its performances, it is in the most secure position to continue a long, long run on Broadway. The notoriety of the Potter franchise gives the play a guaranteed audience who would select it over other Broadway plays and musicals, negating the impact of the 1980s tourism refocusing. Plus, the financial stability of Joanne as producer means that even if ticket sales begin to drop off, it could still be propped up with money from the rest of the Potter franchise to continue its run in the face of audience disinterest. If the performance count does end up adding on to the existing 785 performances, then Cursed Child can expect to play its 1,000th performance in May 2022 the first play since Brighton Beach Memoirs to do so. And if it continues running into 2028, it would have a chance to become the first play in eight decades to finally break the record set by Life with Father. Indeed, on the day that the play opened in 2018, Time Out New York critic Adam Feldman took to Twitter to predict that Harry Potter and the Cursed Child will surpass Life with Father as the longest-running Broadway play of all time. But here's the thing. There's a word that I keep using to describe Cursed Child, which the more that I use it, the more I wonder whether it's appropriate. And that word, strangely enough, is play. 
Because here's a real question that I'm, I'm not asking as a joke. I really want you to think about this. Is Harry Potter and the Cursed Child a play? But like, but like really, is it? I mean, in a practical sense, yes, it is a play. It is a story written with the intention of being performed. But something about it makes it feel different from literally everything else on the long-running plays list. I mentioned earlier that a long Broadway run used to be a key way in which plays set themselves up for regional productions after their Broadway run ended. So I guess to rephrase the question, is any producing organization, other than the ones currently attached to Cursed Child in London and New York, ever going to produce this play regionally? Pick literally any of the 75 companies in the League of Resident Theaters, the major circuit of regional companies in the US. Are any of these organizations going to look at Cursed Child and say, we should produce our own production of this? And I'm not talking about, oh, we should partner with Harry Potter Theatrical to bring the show to our company. No, I mean, is there ever going to be a staging of this show that is not a replica? Will any company want to create one? It does feel like we need some sort of new term, maybe in addition to play, for what Cursed Child is, since its staging seems so elemental to its performance text, in addition to its script. Divorced from its $70 million production, what about this script, this story, would draw audiences to see it? And keep in mind, the Broadway production actively avoided using the story as a selling point, marketing the play with hashtag keep the secrets, and encouraging people to see it for every reason except the plot. I'm actually wearing one of the original pins that they handed out during the first year on Broadway to encourage people not to talk about the plot, and I just realized I'm wearing it sideways. Um, but, uh... Joanne's a turf, so that's what she gets. Maybe you're thinking, okay, fine, but it's Harry Potter, this is a unique case, and maybe there will be regional productions in a few years. Okay, then here's a follow-up question. It's been eight years since it closed on Broadway, and is anyone producing War Horse? War Horse didn't have the same obfuscating attitude towards its own narrative, selling itself as an emotional story of a boy and his horse during World War I. It's poetically written, and the question of how to stage the many scenes with only horses on stage, could be a theatrically interesting one to explore. But no one has done so because to most audiences, War Horse is more puppet than play. Handspring Puppet Company's incredible horse puppets became so intrinsically linked to the play that no staging of the show without that production element has been attempted. Now, do I think that a non-replica production of War Horse could eventually be done sometime after this video's release? Yes. I think it's unlikely, but I do think it could be done. But would I afford the same hypothetical to Curse Child? Probably not. The technical wizardry of its production, no pun intended, is even more unseverably linked to its script than in War Horse. And honestly, the other two long-running British imports of the 2010s also sold themselves on production design. The play that goes wrong is defined by its comically decaying set pieces and precise slapstick. We'll be suspect! <laughs> while Curious Incident was originally produced with intricate projection mapping and a dynamic ensemble cast. Of the four, only Curious Incident has ever been produced regionally. And this actually brings us back to Life with Father, because after the Broadway production closed in 1947, the performance rights were released in 1948. And that is where the real impact of those national tours really becomes apparent, because in the 1948-49 season alone, Life with Father was produced regionally 187 times. Now, obviously, there are a lot of asterisks on that statistic. The regional theater model as we know it today wasn't formalized until 1966, and Life with Father is a comparatively simple show to produce, more aligned stylistically with the long runners of the 20 aughts than the 2010s. But still, it speaks to a larger question around the whole concept of long runs on Broadway. Why do we want plays to run for a long time? Near the end of his book In the Long Run, which documents many of the longest running plays on Broadway, including Life with Father, this has been very helpful, Jordan Schildkraut surmises that many of the plays discussed in this book became long running hits because their producers wanted to create long running hits. It was a point of pride. As production costs rose and Broadway became more corporatized, profit became more important than pride. The mode of theatrical production on Broadway and throughout American culture changed, and one of those losses incurred with the shift was not just the possibility, but the desire for a long-running play. 
He goes on to agree that Cursed Child is in the best position to break the Thousand Performance Barrier, but labels it and its companions in the new British Invasion as a new kind of long-running play. All four of these plays won Tony Awards for their scenic elements, but among all four of them earned exactly one acting nomination. If musicals rather than plays can achieve long Broadway runs, then the plays that can achieve long runs are those that are like musicals. The phrase like musicals is being used as shorthand here for productions that focus on spectacle, but I should point out that not only are there many musicals that don't look like that, but here I should mention the fifth play from the 2010s to run longer than a year, and the only American script, To Kill a Mockingbird. Despite its large cast, the play is a naturalistic legal drama, and instead derives its tourist appeal from the dual star power of its famous source material and its star adapter, Aaron Sorkin, as well as well-known performers in the role of Atticus Finch. And while the script may be produced regionally once the rights are out, it won't be the length of the Broadway run that convinces people to produce it. Curious Incident was the same way. Theaters produced it because the play was interesting, not just because the Broadway run was long. There appears to be no remaining correlation between plays that run long on Broadway and plays that get produced in regional theaters. Looking at American Theater Magazine's leaderboards for the most produced plays in the 2019-2020 season, there are 12 plays represented, out of which only three ran on Broadway. In the 2018-19 season, the numbers were only four plays out of nine with Broadway runs, and in the previous season, the count was only two plays out of eight. Plus, every one of those lists included at least one play that reached the leaderboard without any run in New York at all, on or off Broadway. The only play to appear on all three lists is Curious Incident, tied for first place in the 2019-2020 season. But the play that tied it was A Doll's House Part 2, which saw a combined 39 restagings over two seasons, despite only notching 172 Broadway performances, or five months. What has really changed in the last 10 years, arguably in the last 20, is why long-running plays don't close sooner. The only reward for having a long-running play on Broadway is pride, which perhaps explains exactly why the plays written by Sorkin and Joanne are the only two that were running on Broadway before the pandemic and still reopened after. Many have lauded the new post-pandemic Broadway season, which boasts seven plays by black writers, plus a remount of the previously successful and robbed of Tony Awards slave play. But literally all eight have announced limited runs, with the longest, Thoughts of a Colored Man, only running about six months. And as far as I can surmise, the reason for this is that these plays don't really need long Broadway runs. It's nice to have a high-profile production to gain the show some credibility and perhaps a Tony Award nomination or even a victory, but after that, the focus shifts to seeing the play produced in regional companies, where other artists will put their own spin on the story and bring it to communities outside of the narrow slice of humanity that is New York City. So perhaps Cursed Child will eventually run long enough to take the record away from Life with Father, but what it won't manage to do is take away the milestone that Life with Father represents. Not just the longest running play on Broadway, but the longest running play to then have a life after its record setting run. While it may not be produced much anymore, there's a certain comfort to seeing it remain in its spot atop the long running plays list. A play that not many people know about anymore, holding onto a record that perhaps not many people care about anyway. Okay, now get this pin off my sweater. <laughs> Thank you.